How's everyone doing today? My name is Patrick Myers. I'm a psychologist and I'm working uh, right downstairs here uh, at a place called Complement Healthcare. Uh, we are a bunch of alternate uh, healthcare professionals, so chiropractic, psychology, uh, massage, etc., etc. Um, tonight we are going to be talking about passion and trying to cultivate a little bit more passion in our lives. So that sounds kind of yummy. When I talk about passion, I basically am looking at a more global perspective of passion. I'm looking at those things that make you get up in the morning and say, yes. Those things that make you say, hey, I'm off to work. Oh boy. Those things that make you look at your partner and make you look at your partner anew. Uh, these kinds of things. So it's a more global perspective of passion. All right? Um, so I'm going to start off with a couple of quotes, uh, then I'm going to go to a couple of scientific facts, uh, then we're going to have a couple of definitions, and then finally we're going to get what uh, I would consider as the pièce de résistance, which is the fighter method to cultivating more passion. Alrighty? So a couple of quotes. We are each angels with only one wing. We fly only by embracing one another. Love that quote. A couple more. Without passion, man is mere possibility, like the flint which awaits the shock of the iron before it can give forth spark. <coughs> Genuine passion is like a mountain stream. It admits of no impediment. Go backward, it must go forward. I love these two quotes. These really sort of speak about passion to me. So we have the first one, which is credited to uh, Angela Monet, but actually, when you dig a little bit deeper, it appears to be more that it's uh, Madame de Stahl who uh, it's actually credited to. So those who danced were thought to be quite insane by those who could not hear the music. Madame de Stahl was a French uh, writer and revolutionary, and uh, she sometimes clashed with Napoleon. And when Napoleon finally fell, somebody made the comment, so now there are only three forces left in Europe, <coughs> Russia, England, and Madame de Stahl. <laughs> a wonderful, wonderful movie. Zorba the Greek. Anybody seen Zorba the Greek? Great movie, right? Ah, it's all about passion and madness and whatnot. Great little movie. So, a man needs a little pat, or a man needs a little madness, or else he never dares cut the rope and be free. At, at the same time, you know, I sort of put these up here because it, it's a fine line between madness and passion, and quite often I find myself normalizing what my clients bring in to think thinking that there's something wrong with them, and I'm actually telling them, no, this is normal, this is good, right? So there's a fine line between passion and madness. Passion is like crime, it does not thrive on the established order. So one of the things that I want to put out is, is that passion is a risky endeavor. Passion is a risky endeavor. As uh, if any of you are into the skiing world, you will know a lady by the name of Sarah Burke. Uh, she was uh, a Canadian gold medalist, and unfortunately recently she died on the ski hill. So passion is a risky endeavor, and we have to be aware of that. All right. seem to find anything wrong with you, so we're going to treat you for symptom deficit disorder. I love that quote. So a little bit of facts here. Why, why do we talk about passion? Well, because when we take a look at the top 11 causes of death in 2005, and these are quoted by the World Health Organization, we see a very stressful lifestyle. And to counter that stressful lifestyle, I want to be talking a little bit about passion to try and reduce some of that stress, okay? Interestingly, in the world, a 
for 11 is suicide. And Canada, suicide is number 10. 10% 10 of Canadians in the workforce between the ages of 18 and 54 suffer from some form of mental health issues. This costs the Canadian economy $51 billion per year in lost productivity. So this is, you'll have to excuse me, this is where I jump on my little political soapbox and I go, $51 billion per year. Imagine if we could channel some of that $51 billion per year into things like appropriate education for kids so that they know how to deal with stress. How about giving parents parenting classes for free or making daycare a little bit more available? 51 billion, right? All these things that we could be offering and yet when was it? A couple of months ago, I don't remember quite when it was, I hear in the newspaper that they're increasing money for jails and military weaponry and stuff like that, right? So I'm looking at this and going, like, passion is something that we really need to be passionate about and trying to evoke in people more. All right, here's another one. How about our college students? Richard Cattison went and took a look at 13,000 college students. 45% felt so depressed they couldn't function. 94% felt completely overwhelmed. Wow. Could we use that $51 billion towards our college students? So a little bit about negative and positive emotions. We have a lady by the name of Barbara Fredrickson. She wrote a wonderful book called Positivity. And in it, she takes a look at what she calls broaden and build theory of positive emotions. Now we start off with negative emotions. Negative emotions are there for a reason. They are hardwired into your brain. You can't get rid of them. You can't escape them. And that's exactly why they're there. They're there to help you escape from harm. And so you have basically the fight or flight system, which is anger and fear. Those are built right in. All right? But they also have a tendency of narrowing our attention. They cause a lot of stress and all this kind of stuff. What's the opposite of that, of course, is positive emotions. Positive emotions, instead of narrowing us, have a tendency of expanding us. We relax. We are more creative. Uh, what else? It also affects our health. Uh, it gives us more resilience. Um, and all these kinds of things. We also have a tendency of, uh, she calls it broaden and build. We also have a tendency of building resources. So things like building our friendship circle. You know, these kinds of things when we are in a positive state. Uh, Calvin and Hobbes, you want to go spelunking with me? Spelunking, there aren't any caves around here. You don't need a cave, all you need is a rock. Spelunk. Here's a fun one, the positivity ratio. How much positivity do we need? Well, science basically suggests we need somewhere between <coughs> three to five positive experiences to erase every negative experience. Uh, various different people, so we have a fellow by the name of Losada who was looking at corporate meetings and he realized that if there are uh, less than three positive uh, remarks in a corporate meeting, uh, then the negative remarks or criticisms, then if there are less than three, then you're looking at a company that is on its slow way out of business. Right? Uh, who else we have? have Gottman. So Gottman is a guy that I absolutely love. He does a lot of couples therapy and I use the Gottman method. And he basically looks at it and he says that couples require five positive interactions. So these don't have to be big interactions, but they have to be five positive interactions in order to reduce one negative interaction. Notice how if you have an argument with your partner, how long it takes you to get over that, right? So, positive emotions are really, really important. Anybody else? Um, 
general well-being uh, requires three positive experiences for every negative experience. That's Fredrickson and Schwartz found in therapy, and this is one of the things that I quite often try to focus on, is to say quite often therapy starts on a negative note, but I always try to turn it towards a positive note, because we need in therapy for it to be successful. We need about four positive statements, four positive interactions for a client to then start feeling better compared to the one negative. All right? Interestingly, there is an upper limit, and that is about 11 positive experiences for every negative experience. You don't get much better after 11, right? Okay, so I don't know how to pronounce this here, but in 1972, uh, Bhutan's king, I think it's Wang Chuk, coined the term gross national happiness in order to replace the gross domestic product. Basically what he was looking at, he was, he was looking at the fact that uh, economic development on our planet is outpacing our ecological resources. You know, we're starting to run out of different things. We're creating a whole lot of pollution and all this kinds of stuff. And when this is happening, you know, when your economy is outpacing what your natural uh, world can absorb, then the question is, is, does that also threaten human civilization? So gross national happiness instead is a thing that takes into consideration a bunch of things. So it takes a look at sustainable economic development, it takes a look at environmental conservation, physical, mental, and spiritual health, educational opportunities, and standard of living, social and community and cultural vitality, work-life balance, uh, healthy workplaces, and good political governance, governance. And you can see my little red arrow here. Canada falls about in the middle of uh, the gross national happiness quotient. So we're doing okay, but could get better. And you will find that they measure gross national happiness in different ways. This is just one measurement here. So. All right, so why do we talk about passion? Why do we talk about positivity? It's because all these wonderful health things occur. So we have lower stress, lower risk of disease, uh, increased wound healing, lower levels of inflammation, better sleep, uh, better physical performance, better mental performance all these wonderful things that come as a result. Okay, so now we're, that's the science a little bit, and now we're going to talk about a little bit about definitions. And so we start out with what is the root of passion, and we go back, uh, the etymology, uh, we go back to pasio or pasio, uh, which are Greek and Latin, and they were referring to the physical, emotional, mental, uh, spiritual uh, sufferings of Jesus. We also talk about the passion of Joan of Arc as well. Um, and this is a very um, religious kind of connotation to passion. Now, I'm going to say that I'm a psychologist. I'm not a minister or a priest, and so I'm going to allow the ministers and priests to talk about the the religious aspects of passion, I'm talking about a more generalized uh, conception of passion. Okay? We take a look at the uh, dictionary. The dictionary uh, defines passion as a number of things. So, a strong emotion such as love, anger, and envy, the object of an intense desire, ardent love, affection, and lust. And then at the bottom we have boundless enthusiasm. Now again, I'm going to have a tendency to steer away from those first three, um, and this is to some degree why. So what this is, is this is uh, a wonderful study done by a lady by the name of Helen Fisher, who she conducted functional MRI scans uh, of uh, people, um, and this
this is 21-year-olds uh, who were in romantic relationships for an average of seven months. And she found that with these people, compared to people who were not in relationships, she found that certain areas of the brain lit up. Okay? And these areas of the brain are referred to as the caudate nucleus up here, the uh, ventral digmental area, uh, which is here, and various aspects of the cingulate cortex, which is over there. What are these things? These are all dopamine driven, and if you know anything about dopamine driven, you know that this is the reward system. One of the interesting things is if you take a look at these pictures, and you take a look at some pictures of other particular group of people, you find that they overlap. And the other group of people that have exactly these same kinds of pictures are drug addicts. So when you take cocaine, it's the same thing that it's doing to your brain. All right? Certain areas of the brain light up. And so there is a saying that says something to the effect of love is a drug. And I would have a tendency to say, yes, love is a drug. However, not quite. What we are talking about is we are talking about romantic love as a drug. Okay? There are sort of three different things that we want to differentiate. There is romantic love, there is lust, and then there is mature love. So the romantic love, which is sometimes referred to as passion, is something that I don't really want to get into that too much. I want to look more at the global aspect of it. And so I'm going to take the last definition that I talked about, which is more of the boundless enthusiasm, the yes, I'm alive kind of thing. Alrighty? So we have a couple of similar terms, which you will find that these terms very much overlap with what we are talking about in passion. We have Martin Seligman, who originally began studying something called learned helplessness, uh, which is a big factor of our models of depression. And then one day, his daughter cued him into the fact that he was studying the wrong thing, right? And so he started turning things around. He started looking at, well, okay, so if we have learned helplessness, what's the opposite? And he had something called learned optimism. And part of that learned optimism is the ability to be happy. And happiness is that confluence of pleasure, engagement, and meaning. All right? Michael Yapko, who's a fairly big name therapist out there, he talks about uh, vision. And he says that a lot of people, he's, uh, he studies a lot uh, of uh, people who are depressed. And he says that a lot of people who are depressed lack a sense of vision in their life. And so vision is this goal-directed behavior that aims at beneficial outcomes while being aware of potential consequences. Okay. Anybody who can pronounce that name? <laughs> I'm really bad at trying to pronounce that name, so I'm not even going to try and pronounce it. Anyways, he's a wonderful fellow who now has joined forces with Martin Seligman. This fellow, he has studied flow, which is the confluence of skill and challenge and the attention uh, on an activity that you give uh, to something that is intrinsically rewarding. <coughs> There's now another fellow by the a name of Dave Jones, and he has something called Passion Works. And so he's looking specifically at passion in work. And he basically has something very similar. So it looks like this. We have up here, we have uh, the first fellow who was talking about flow, looking at skill and challenge, and where those two meet, we have flow. The other fellow who had passion, and we have passion happening as a result of meaning and progress and action. Alrighty. So let's get into cultivating more passion. When I say cultivating more passion, then I want you to be both a lover and a fighter. And I use this fighter an acronym to uh, sort of bounce off of as, um, 
as what are some of the things that we can do to cultivate more passion in our lives. So uh, F stands for fear and complacency, I stands for ice cream, G stands for gratitude, H stands for humor, uh, D stands for time, E is experiment, and R is reflect, and we'll go into those in detail. So cultivating more passion, one of the biggest things that we find that gets in the way of passion is fear. And so I've listed a couple here. Overcoming the fear of rejection, failure, deadlines, mortgages, bills, marriage and children, job loss, death, success. Can you guys think of other things that would cause you fear? Health. Health, yeah. yeah. Losing your life. Sorry? Losing your life. Yes, losing your life, absolutely, yep. Yeah. Losing your mental faculties, yeah, all kinds of things, right? And so it's one of the, the things towards cultivating more passion is that we want to push ourselves beyond fear. However, the other side of fear is we also want to push ourselves beyond complacency. Instead of coming home and plunking ourselves in front of the TV, we want to push ourselves beyond that complacency. Okay, so, when we talk about fear, over on the, what's this, the left-hand side, right, we have a fellow by the name of Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela had a passion to bring equality to his country. And as a result of his passion, a lot of people became very afraid, and they threw him in jail for about 30 years. He didn't waver on his passion message got out there and slowly the world uh, came behind him and then slowly the country went behind him as well and he went from the, I guess you might say the lowest position in his country which was prisoner to the highest position in his country which was he became the leader of South Africa. All by holding on to the passion, the belief that equality is what we need. A couple other people pictured here. We have Milton Erickson and Viktor Frankl, who are both uh, very influential psychotherapists. Uh, Milton Erickson, uh, I'm a huge fan of Milton Erickson. Milton Erickson uh, survived polio, not once, but twice. Some people are so young that they don't even know what polio is. Some of us do know that polio at a particular time in our history, normally killed people. So to be able to survive it not once but twice is quite the feat. Viktor Frankl also pulled <coughs> off an interesting feat. He was interned in Auschwitz, and he survived. And he went on to talk about man's search for meaning. So both of these guys leave a very big legacy and I just recently attended the Milton Erickson Foundation uh, um, presentation down in Phoenix, and there was, I don't know, three, four thousand people all down there honoring a guy who had a huge impact on psychotherapy. And I know that Viktor Frankl also draws huge crowds to his conferences. Person on the left was, this lady was interned in a prisoner of war camp, in a Japanese prisoner of war camp uh, during World War II. Uh, she almost starved to death and that malnutrition continued to affect her health throughout life. But even a few months before her untimely death, she was still what is called candy striping or going to hospitals and catering and visiting the, the sick and the elderly. And this individual was a very passionate and very inspiring individual. That was my life. The person over on that side is a fellow by the name of Kieran Bayon. And this is a fellow that you may see this summer. So Kieran at age 10 had a tumor removed from his thigh. Uh, 
Uh, this left him with severe pain and a prognosis that he probably wouldn't walk again. Well, he wasn't going to take that. And so a year and a half later, he was back up and around. During the, what was it, the 2000 Olympics, he was watching the 2000 Olympics, and he looked at his parents and he says, I want to become an Olympian. He had a real passion. I want to become an Olympian. So some parents enrolled him in gymnastics. They thought that that would be the best one for him. But a year later, he ended up sliding and ended up falling on his head, and this damaged inner ear. And inner ear, if you know, is where you get your balance from, and so his balance was totally off. Really hard to do gymnastics if you don't have a sense of balance. Again, Kieran said no to the prognosis, and he fought his way back. This time it took a little longer. This time it took him three years. Then in 2010, I think it is, 2010, uh, in a qualifying competition, he broke, what was it? Oh, no, sorry, he dislocated his knee, which required major surgery. Just this past January, Kieran found out that he's going to be the first Irishman representing Ireland as a gymnast, the first Irish gymnast in the Olympics. Pretty impressive. So you're going to see this guy on TV this summer. All right, so then I talk about the three choices. And I put it out that we basically have three choices in life, all right? These are, to some degree, uh, tied to neurological constructs that happen inside your brain. And on the outside, we are basically left with three choices in life, all right? And those three choices are, over on that side, we have what would be called the amygdala, which is fight or flight, which is fear and anger. When the world does something, we can react out of fear and anger, all right? Then we have another choice, which is when the world does something, we can react out of, and there are various terms for this one. I call it complacency. I call it ambivalence. I call it, oh, I'm too tired. I'm just going to watch some TV right now. It's called, I don't know. Why don't you choose? It's called... I know you have my best interests at heart. You pick, all right? That's this choice. And then we have the third choice. When the world presents something to us, we have the choice of moving forward with purpose and intention. So, what happens if most of my reactions to the world are out of fear? Or anger. What happens if most of my reactions to the world are out of complacency? And I say, well, it gets a little bit ugly then. So we'll just uh, we'll look at this side over here because it's harder to reach over that side. So this is complacency. When the world presents something to us, you know, I had a hard day at work. You decide, I've got one of three choices. I can react out of fear purpose and intention, or complacency. If I choose complacency, there we go. Now the world is going to present something to us, something interesting on TV. And then we have one of three choices. I can react to this out of fear, purpose, or complacency. And what happens is that if we choose complacency more often than not, then what happens is it eventually comes around to the original issue. Only problem is, is that each time it goes around, this original issue gets bigger and bigger, muddier and muddier, messier and messier, and more and more difficult to change. It is the same with fear. If we are very reactive in life, react out of fear, same thing. We have a tendency to go around and around in circles. Right? And so, what I am encouraging people to do is to move forward with purpose and intention. However, I am going to come back to this going to stick on fear for right now, all right? So fear. 
or sorry, no, wait a minute. This is complacency first. I've decided to live my life in ambivalence. Well, maybe. I can't decide. I'm so poor. That's complacency. Here's, here's fear. This ought to be interesting. A psychologist who's afraid of public speaking is giving a talk to an audience who's afraid of public listening. So, cultivating uh, more passion is making realizations about certain things such as nothing's perfect, no one's perfect, there is no right answer. Not everybody is going to like you. Not everyone's going to appreciate your work. However, that said, there is a time limit. There is a time limit. Eventually, we all return. Right? And so, it is important to take a look at life and say, okay, we need an answer that works for now. All right? We need to do a job that's good enough. We need to think about cultivating a tolerance for others. Isn't tolerance one of uh, our big Canadian sort of things that we are passionate about in spring in Canada? Is tolerance, right? So cultivating tolerance for others and spending more time actually focused on what's fun in life, right? There's so much time, or sorry, there's so much to do, so little time to do it, so let's have a little fun. You guys recognize this guy? So, this is Steve Jobs. Uh, I read a couple of stories about Steve Jobs because Steve Jobs was, I think, one of the, a really consummate individual in knowing about avoiding fear and really following his passion. Life. So I read two little stories here. Uh, and this was around 1990. Steve Jobs met a lady by the name of Lorene Powell uh, after he spoke to a class at Stanford Business School. He, they got to chatting. He thought she was kind of cute. They exchanged numbers. But he was on his way to a business dinner. And so he says goodbye, and he's on his way to his business dinner. And he's walking to his car, and he's going, wait a minute, wait a minute. What would I rather do right now? Go and sit in some stuffy meeting or have dinner with this beautiful woman? And so quickly he turned around and ran after her and he says, Wait a minute. You want to go for dinner? They walk into town together and this is, or this was, I guess still is, Mrs. Jokes. All right? Steve Jobs is also famous for a speech that he gave, a convocation that a speech that he gave, and part of the speech went like this. When I was 17, I read a quote that went something like this. If you live each day as if, as if it is your last, someday you're going to be right. Remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool that I've ever encountered to help me make big choices in life because almost everything, all external expe expectations, all pride, all fear of embarrassment or failure, these things just fall away in the face of death, leaving only what is truly important. Remembering that you are going to die is the best way I know to avoid the, uh, the trap of thinking you have something to lose. You're already na naked. There is no reason not to follow your heart. So that was Steve Jobs. And so one of the, the interventions that I sometimes use with clients, because I get kind of harsh here, and I say, so let's use death as an advisor. If you had one hour left to live, how would you live your life differently? If you had one day left to live, how would you live your life differently? And you're going to notice, if you really sort of take a look inside and answer these questions to yourself, you're going to notice that the answers change a little bit, right? If you had one week left to live, what would you do with the rest of your life? If you had one month left to live, what would you do differently? One year, one decade. 
problem is we don't know how much time we have left to live. And yet something inside of us knows what it is that we would do, right? We know what that is. And so that brings us to the next part, which is ice cream, yay, or what I refer to as identity. How could somebody steal my identity when I still haven't figured out who I am? So for this, I'm going to need a volunteer to shout your answers from afar. All right, you don't actually have to come up here. So this is another intervention that I give some of my clients sometimes. And that is that sometimes clients will come in to me and they will say, I truly don't know what I want. I truly don't know what I like. And I give them a simple example. So somebody shout out an answer here, okay? So somebody who likes ice cream. If I were to offer you an ice cream cone, I said, would you like an ice cream cone? You say yes. And I say, I've got chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry. Which one would you like? Chocolate. Chocolate. <laughs> oh, rather <laughs> resounding. Okay, so here's your chocolate ice cream cone. Now, suppose that you come back to my next uh, presentation, and I say, hey, would you like an ice cream cone? You say yes. And I say, I've got vanilla, strawberry, and pistachio. What's going to be this time? Vanilla. Well, for you, it's going to be pistachio. For you, it's going to be vanilla. All right, okay, so vanilla. There we go. And now I come back the next time or you come back the next time and I say, hey, I got ice cream again. Would you like an ice cream cone? I've got strawberry, pistachio, and Rocky Road. Which one would you like? Full. You're full. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a presentation every day here. <laughs> All right. Basically, what I'm trying to point out is that with a simple little exercise like this, I'm trying to point out that each time you were able to, whether you shout it out or not, you were able to figure out which of those three would be the one that I want right now. What is my preference? Right? And not only that, but each time when I took your favorite preference away and I replaced it with something else, at the very least, you were still able to say, what's the lesser of three evils here? I noticed that everyone liked chocolate, but then when I got to the next one, you had some discrepancy here, right? So you're still able to pick one and go, ah, ooh, that would be fun for me, right? And so we have preferences. You have preferences in what color you like to wear. You have preferences in, for those of us who drive, what kind of car you drive. We have preferences in all kinds of things. And so therefore, I tried to use this example to point out that you have preferences which are going to indicate to you what is your passion, right? To some degree, that's an easy thing. There's one more thing that's connected to this, and that's the R, which we'll get to. But I'm just trying to point out right now that people have preferences, okay? Here's another way of putting the same question. If you had a million dollars, if I were to give you a million dollars right now, what would you do? Oh, you know what you would do? I'd get a financial advisor. You'd get a financial <laughs> advisor. But what would you do with the money? Well, after she advised me, I would do what she said. I don't want to lose it. Right. But would you spend a little bit of it? Oh, sure. Well, of course you would. Well, kids and give them all. All right, so you'd give your kids some money too, right? And I'm guessing maybe you have some grandkids, a couple of grandkids. So, wouldn't it be fun to buy them some presents too, right? Yeah. So, one of the things that I try to point out is is that a million dollars in this day and age is not enough to retire on, but it will buy you maybe ten years of income. So, what would you do with a million dollars? Would you travel around the world? Would you buy yourself a fancy house? Although in Vancouver, a million dollars is not going to buy you that fancy house anymore. 
Would you go back to school? I'm a real glutton for punishment. If I had a million dollars, I'd go back to school. Right? I've spent most of my life in school, but I'd go back to school again if I had a million dollars. And so again, when you answer that question, if I had a million dollars, what would I do? It's not enough to retire on, but it's certainly enough to all of a sudden take a look at your life and go, let's see, do I really want to do this boring nine to five job every day? You know, I think actually I would work less. I'd still work, but I'd work less. Or I would, and you notice that your preferences, your passion comes out there, right? So identifying who am I? What flavor of ice cream am I? What is my identity? All right. And if you're still going to tell me that I don't know who I am, then I'm going to say that there are a bunch of questionnaires here that you could go take a look at. Uh, the first one is by uh, uh, Martin Seligman. These are ones that generally a, a psychologist would administer, so the strong interest in Victoria, the Myers Briggs, sometimes the color test. Uh, and then there are some tests out on the, uh, the internet as well. I cannot vouch for these, but you know, you have various things. Actually, I should make a point here. Uh, let's see if it's on the next one. No, it's not on the next one. Um, I forgot to, uh, well, I didn't forget. My printer is down right now, and so there are handouts for this, okay? Uh, it, when This is the website, and then you will find somewhere along here, if you keep an eye out, you'll also find that I have my email site. So you're more than welcome to email me or there are cards up there and brochures, you're more than welcome to email me. Put it in the subject line, Passion Handouts, and I'll send you the handouts for this, okay? Hi there. Hi. All right, so where are we at now? Cultivating more passion. Being grateful for what you get in life, right? Big and small. It's really, really important. And there's lots of science behind gratitude and cultivating happiness and passion as a result of gratitude. In this hermitage, all the mosquitoes are small. What a lovely gift. Here's another wonderful name that I'm not exactly... Oh, here's that email address, if you want. Okay? Here's another wonderful name. I think this one is pronounced uh, Lubermirsky. Mirsky, sorry. Uh, and she has a book on happiness, and she's done some studies on happiness. And one of the things that she looks at is she looks at the fact that kids, on average, laugh about 300 times a day. She predicts that adults, we laugh about 20 times per day. How's your laughter quotient for today? <laughs> so... There's all kinds of science behind <coughs> laughter. So one of the things is, is that there was a fellow by the name of Norman Cousins. He wrote uh, a lot of books on laughter. And Norman Cousins is famous for curing his cancer by when he got diagnosed with cancer, he locked himself up in his room. He rented a whole pile of movies like Marx Brothers, Three Stooges, this kind of stuff. And he just sat there and he laughed his cancer away. And then he went out and on to write about it. So he turned his laughter into passion. Um, laughter is also an extremely useful thing in that there are three times when uh, these are released, and that is in exercise, in tears, and in laughter. And what is released is within your brain, you have something called endorphins. And these endorphins are released when you laugh. Now, endorphins are the brain's very own happy and pain-killing chemicals. So laughter is good for us. Cultivating a little more laughter. Life throws too many curveballs at us. So developing a little bit of a sense of humor regarding these curveballs is a good idea. All right. So... Cultivating more passion, we have time. And so, 
two of the things that are involved with time is, one is, is that time requires a certain amount of effort. If you don't put effort towards passion, you're not going to have a passionate life. So you have to take the time. You have to push aside other things and you have to take the time to say, I want to do this. I'm passionate about this, right? So actually you have to push aside. But time also has an interesting feature in that time changes everything. So everything that you were once, you no longer are. You're now something new. Not only that, but your passions may also flow as you go through life. And so what you were passionate about when you were 10 years old may be quite different from what you were passionate at when you were 20 years old, which may be quite different from what you're passionate about now. It's very rare that I see somebody who says, well, when I was 10 years old, I wanted to be a doctor, and now I'm a doctor, and I absolutely love it. It happens once in a while, but most of us, when I want to be, when I was 10 years old, I wanted to be a fireman. Not me. So, oh, here's another one too that I, I wanted to point out regarding time and how passion has a tendency to flow. If you had asked me at age 20, or you know, just when I'm graduating high school, I guess actually that was about 18, somewhere around there, would I want to be a psychologist? I would have laughed. I would have laughed. I would have said, no, absolutely not. But then, as I got a little older, all of a sudden something in me changed. And now, I couldn't think of a better job to do. I'm very passionate about this. I'm trying, that's sort of why I'm here too, is trying to share my passion with you guys, right? On the other hand, we also have changes that happen in the opposite way. When I was age 20, I was very passionate about skiing. I still am very passionate about skiing. The problem is, my knees are not so passionate about skiing these days, so although I still ski, I'm no longer skiing the double black diamonds, I now ski the blue and the green ones, the easier ones, right? So realizing that passion is supposed to flow with time. It's important to experiment. Definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again, and each time hoping that you'll get a different result. Definition of insanity is bending over for somebody and doing what they want, doing what they want, doing what they want, doing what they want, and hoping that someday they will reciprocate. It won't necessarily. That is not to say that we don't, we're not out there giving to people. It's just, it's also important to every now and then take a little bit. And that requires a little bit of experimentation because we don't really know what's going to work for us sometimes. We don't know what's going to work for the world, right? So, E stands for experiment. What have you got to lose? So experiment with life. Take up a new hobby. Learn some art. Go back to school. Come to presentations like this. Go look up some old friends. Go make some new friends. Go travel the world. Go learn to cook. My partner, I drive her nuts because I always love to experiment with new spices. It drives her nuts because she doesn't like some of the spices that I choose. Uh, what else? Try to emulate other inspiring individuals. So there were a couple of people earlier that I showed you that I tried to emulate. Take a chance on love. So we get back to the three choices, and I have two caveats to the three choices. So if the world presents something and we move forward with purpose and intention, then the world is again going to present us with something. And we again have three choices from which to react. The complacency, the fear, and the purpose and intention. If we choose the purpose and intention, we get to move forward. Purpose and intention moves us forward. However, I do want to give two caveats and say, not quite so fast, okay? 
one of the things that we notice is that if I follow complacency more often than not, it goes around and around in circles. But sometimes in life, complacency is appropriate. Sometimes fear is appropriate. If you are walking down the sidewalk and a mad dog comes running at you with its teeth gnashing, is it a good idea to reach your hand out and go, nice doggy? Probably not. It's probably a good idea to run or find the biggest stick that you can. So fear and anger there is appropriate. I use an example as well uh, in um, complacency. Suppose that you are out with a bunch of friends doing a particular activity. Everybody has settled on we're going to do a particular activity. Right? And the activity takes a little longer than what you expected. And somebody in the group all of a sudden realizes, and they put, you know, and they voice their their realization, I'm hungry. And then you take a look inside and you go, oh gee, yeah, I'm kind of hungry too. And somebody else goes, I'm hungry too. Let's go for pizza. Well, the question is, is, do you need to say no? Or do you just be complacent and say, yeah, pizza is a good idea. And I would have a tendency to say, pizza is a good idea. Go with the pizza. Why? Because your greater purpose and intention of being there was to be out with your friends doing whatever activity it was. What you eat is secondary. Now, of course, there is a greater purpose and intention above that as well, and that is, is you want to be alive. So, if you happen to have celiac disease, which, I don't know, I, the best way I can describe it is it's an allergy to wheat. It's not quite that, but it's the best way I can describe it. Then, you're going to want to say, you're going to want to, with purpose and intention, say, hey folks, celiac, remember, this is not good for me. Wherever we go, we're going to have to make sure that they have non-wheat products. Right? So in that case, purpose and intention is important. But if you don't have celiac, <coughs> what does it matter if you eat pizza? Your main purpose and intention was to be out with friends doing their activity. Right? So flexibility is the key in that sometimes complacency is okay, sometimes fear and anger are okay. But I'm going to say that for the most part, the world does not present this to us. And if we want passion in life, then it is important that we take most of our choices out of purpose and intention. Okay? So that's caveat number one. Caveat number two. Heads or tails? Heads. Heads. How do you know? Yes. You guessed, right. And to some degree, I'm going to suggest that this is what life is, is that we guess, right? We guess as to what's appropriate. And you said heads? Is that what you said? Yeah. If we were playing for money, you would owe me two dollars. <laughs> Good thing we're not playing for money, right? Is that clue to HST? <laughs> yeah. We as humans have a very large brain, and so we're pretty good at being able to notice patterns and predict what the future will be. However, we're not perfect at pre predicting the future. Right? And so there is a certain amount of, we don't know, when we take a step forward out of purpose and intention, we don't know. And so, I say, you know, I've got this colored here for a reason, and that is, is I would say that when we take a step forward with purpose and intention, that sometimes things are going to work out the way that we want them to work out, right? And I would call that success. And then sometimes we guess wrong. Our passion takes us down a path that guesses wrong. And I would call that failure. Now notice how I'm going to put the next sentence. Which would you rather have? 100% failure or 50% failure? As I noted at the beginning, passion is a risky business. All right? But what are the rewards? The other routes, we have a tendency of getting kind of 
is stuck in life. So very much I encourage people to experiment with life, move forward with purpose and intention. All right. We finally get towards the end, which is the R, which is taking time to reflect. Sometimes I ask people and they say, what do your lunch hours look like? What do your coffee breaks look like? And they say, it looks a little bit like this. Right? And then I pull out all my stuff about stress and how this is bad for you and all this kind of stuff. You, you might think that you're doing good things here, but in the long run, this is going to catch up with you. And I say, take some time. You're given a coffee break for a reason. Take your time. Enjoy life. Take some time to reflect. Take some time to have fun. So, reflection. Cultivating more compassion. Take time to reflect. To savor your successes. To experience sensuality. To follow your wins. To ask why or why not. To ask who am I? What is that identity in me? What are my passions? What are my preferences? To dream, to dare. There we have fighter. One of the things that I put out is, is that life becomes interesting in that when we start moving forward with purpose and intention, once we start moving forward with passion, it's as if we start creating this vortex, this, this suction in behind us. And what happens is then life starts to draw in towards you and more and more good stuff starts drawing in towards you. When we follow this life of passion and purpose and intention. So, I suggest that by following the passion of life, we start creating this vortex and life actually starts becoming easier. So, I think that is about it. Yes. So, for any of you who have seen me before, you will see that I keep on throwing this one up. And this, to some degree, is my reflection of passion. I love this particular little uh, thing. This is what's referred to as a Zen cone. And this is a question that they ask Buddhist monks to help them gain enlightenment. And so one evening a thief uh, crept up uh, to Raikan's mountain hut. There was nothing left to steal. Raikan uh, returned and caught him. You've come a long way to visit me, he told the prowler. And you should not be empty-handed. Please take my clothes as a gift. Of course, the bewildered thief took the clothes and slunk away. Raikan sat naked upon his mountaintop, watching the moon, and said, Poor fellow, I wish I could give him this beautiful room. And this is really my definition of passion. This is, uh, uh, I guess you might say, a statement that see me carry around a lot is this particular statement. So that is my little presentation on passion. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Kind of a long presentation, but <coughs> does this mean? This is something that is going to mean different things to different people. Uh, and so to some degree this is um, what do you take as meaning from this? But to some degree why they give these, uh, these cones is because what they're trying to point out is, is that there is more to life than the physical. The, the, the Zen Buddhists were very much into trying to um, escape the physical and so this is to some degree escaping the physical and it's really noticing the here, the now it's really noticing what's in your heart that's what's important not the clothes that I wear not the fancy car that I drive these kinds of things the fancy cars the fancy clothes these are all distractions from, from, a, a, from, a, from this kind of a perspective that's my interpretation. But as I say, 
everyone is supposed to gain a little bit of their own interpretation, and it's also meant as an aid to help bring some form of enlightenment. Some form of making life a little bit easier. There's another one that I sometimes use as well. It's, uh, I, to some degree, bastardize the quote, but it's, again, it's a Buddhist saying, and it goes something along the lines, I paraphrase it, and it goes something along the lines of, in life, pain is mandatory, suffering is optional. You are going to hit bumps in the road. As I said, as I pointed out, sometimes we do fail, right? We cannot predict everything in the future with 100% accuracy. So sometimes we do fail. We do have bumps in the road. Sometimes there is pain. But do you want to stay in the pothole, or do you want to find a way to get out? And this is what passion. I think it's passionless. Another one I, I like is to hope for the best but plan for the worst. Yep. And the idea that the dichotomy of not having this one choice. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. I guess my question would be does passion always have to have a strong element of risk? Or can it have varying degrees? Oh, definitely it has varying degrees of risk. It has varying degrees of risk. And then again, it would also be a question of what's the definition of risk? For some of us, jumping out of an airplane with a parachute would be risky. For some of us, it'd be like, whoa, this looks like a lot of fun, right? But that same person who might jump out of an airplane with a parachute on their back might also think that doing this here right now is a very risky endeavor, right? And they may not be able to do a presentation like this. So it, it risk is really kind of a subjective so it doesn't have to necessarily be on the pain scale, the risk yeah, of pain no, scale. definitely not. No. It doesn't have to include pain. The, the one thing I like about uh, what you talked about is I always think of people that learn art or music, and it's something that uses all these elements yeah. to pursue, not to achieve, but to pursue. Yeah. And if you want to be good right away, you're, you're just so many barricades, but yeah. you have to be able to start and begin and take a step and then go through a little bit of risk, failure, success, growth, yeah. you know, and, and I like that idea. Yeah. I think it's enjoying the journey. Yes, enjoying passion. The journey. Yes, absolutely. Passion is a process, absolutely. Yes, enjoying the journey. Stopping to smell the roses, so mm -hmm. to speak. I'm practically learning from those bumps in the road. Yep. Yep. This is right now off the subject. But oh, on your, your pamphlet, yes. what is that, a scarf? <laughs> That's a really cool uh, cool little swatch there, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I, I can't make anything else out of it. Actually, if you turn it sideways, what that is is that is smoke. Uh, that, that picture was not taken by me. That was taken by a photographer. Oh, it was. Who was passionate about photography. And what that is is smoke. Smoke? And then what he did is he put a red lens on the thing. A red red lens on. A red, yeah. yeah. So he put a red lens on. It looks so like a scarf. It does, yeah. 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 And then I tried to see a body under it, <laughs> I see it. and I'm quite blind, so yeah. I can't yeah. see yeah. anyway. No, but. the uh, the fellow who does who does that little picture, uh, he goes by the nickname of Lucretius. I don't know about the name, but he goes by the nickname of Lucretius, and uh, he has all kinds of these things. He isn't the only artist out there who does this. There's a lot of artists who like to take and play with smoke, and they do all kinds of yeah. really neat stuff with oh, it. Oh, they probably see it. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay, thanks. Absolutely. Do you, yeah. have, do you have another talk planned? I do have another talk planned. Where are they? Um, they're not for a little while. We, uh, we present these talks about once a month, and I have a whole bunch of my colleagues downstairs who are presenting. Uh, you can find the, the talks listed in the leisure guide. And let's see if I can find where my talks are. I've got two talks coming up. One is called the Worry Trap. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how to deal with anxiety. And then the other one is going to be perfectionism. So the one on perfectionism Perfectionism versus uh, striving for uh, excellence will be on June the 6th. 
And then worry trap. Seven p.m. Sorry. Seven. Same time, same place. Yeah. Nice. Worry trap will be somewhere in July, I think it is. Oh, here it is. Looks like July twenty fifth is the worry trap. Next year, I hope to uh, do a presentation on couples, and I think the contemplation is another one that I'd like to do. And then I believe that I'm also redoing the one, as you heard earlier, as I believe I'm also redoing the one on pain. So I'm always sort of planning these things out, but there are other, my colleagues who also